Good morning, good morning, good morning, Central. This is the day that the Lord has made. Okay, I'll help you. And I choose to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Hit it, maestro. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give Jesus a hand clap. Hallelujah. Lord, we bless you today. Thank you for who you are. Glory to God. I hope you feel good about God today. I'm telling you what, he's on the throne and God is moving. Uh, you have, I hope you got a bulletin. I didn't see anybody back there handing them out. So if you didn't get one, there's, they're back there in the back. Um, we've got uh, Mother's Day fast approaching, right? Got all kinds of events. I'm looking for something immediate. I don't see anything immediate on the schedule other than girls' ministry mission-giving opportunity. Girls going to camp May 3rd through 5th and all that good stuff. All right, how about that? Is that good enough? <laughs> Why don't you stand with us this morning? I am so glad you're here. There's a lot of things moving, changing. You know, we're uh, just, just, just keep looking up. Things are, there's, it's a new season, right? And the one thing that you and I need to be very, very conscious, make a concerted effort, right? Come on, just get a hold of your mind. I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, keep your eyes on Jesus. Come on, tell somebody, keep your eyes on Jesus. The writer of Hebrews says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. Hallelujah. I had somebody tell me one time, you know, Pastor, I, I just don't know if I can keep the faith. I'm like, well, thank God it's not up to you. Come on. If he authored your faith, he's going to finish your faith. You quit, you quit trying to have faith and keep your eyes on the prize. Come on. You keep your eyes on Jesus, and he's going to take care of everything else. Amen. Come on, y'all. Man, I tell you what, there's reason to shout in this house this morning. God is good. And he's right now, he is watching over his promises to you to make sure that you reach that expected end. The promises of God are in Jesus, yes and amen. Come on. How many of you are holding on to a promise today? Come on. If you're not, get one before this service is over this morning. I, I, I've been praying since Monday night when God dropped this, this message this morning in my heart that, that God will stir you up, will challenge you today. Amen. That this is not just a normal service. We didn't come here just to sing a few songs and hear a good story and go home. I want you to have an encounter with the living Christ. And I want, let, how many of you believe that if Jesus, I mean, if he just walked in the room and looked right at you, how many of you would have some things you'd say, I need to adjust? Guess what? He's here. He's here. And I want you to prepare to make those heart adjustments this morning. These altars are going to be open the entire service. You're not going to freak me out. I did cowboy church for too many years. You can't freak me out while I'm preaching. So you feel free to come to these altars. Now, we, we're not going to stop and receive offerings, but Christians are going to tithe. So we've got baskets here, baskets in the back. We've got online giving. Please do that. Amen. Give, give your tithe. Give to missions. We got our four of a half of our team came back uh, yesterday. Woo! As soon as we get everybody back in, we're going to have a, a, a tremendous testimony service. They, the, they, they, they had, I don't know, 120, 30 girls, I think they said, and, uh, and then workers with that, right? So, you know, between 170, 200 people there. And, and they said, next year, we want y'all to come back. We're going to have a, a big conference. <laughs> uh, but lives were changed. Amen. And it's because of your giving, and we thank you for that. Hallelujah. Why don't you lift your hands to heaven this morning? Father God, we love you and thank you for all that you're doing. And Lord, I pray 
that every human that's in this room and those that are watching this online will have an encounter with your presence today that will let them know that there is a God in heaven and that, Lord, you are, are affording us, you're opening up to us an opportunity to come to you, <clears throat> to receive from you that love and that peace and that grace. And Lord, some of them are coming in here today. They need help. Lord, I thank you that you are an ever-present help in our time of need. And so, Holy Spirit, I thank you for manifesting that today. Holy Spirit, we give you permission to come in here and just make Jesus real to every one of us through the gifts of the Spirit, through, uh, Lord, Lord, just your personal ministry and comfort to individuals. I thank you, Lord, that you're here. And we yield our lives to you. And we say, come on in, Jesus, and have your way. It's our prayer. Bless my friends today in Jesus' mighty name. And the church said a great big loud amen. amen. Come on, give him another big hand clap. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody go. in here say hallelujah. Come on, hallelujah. You are worthy, God. Come on, just sing his praises this morning. Hallelujah.
you're desperate for him, you're going to do something desperate this morning. Father God, we pray in the name of Jesus that you open the windows of heaven over Central Assembly this morning, God. We ask that you pour out your fire, you pour out your wind, you pour out your floods. In the name of Jesus, we lift you high. We lift you high, God. Reign in this place, almighty God. Reign in this place. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven this day. In the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody. Give him a hand clap this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, sing that again. We're singing around. your mouth is far better than anything this worship team can do as you lift your praises to the king of kings and to the lord of lords he can do such a mighty work through you we worship you god we worship you father we magnify you jesus you are the king of kings lord have your way in this place mighty god have your way in this place mighty god come on you might need to tell him this morning lord have your way in this place have your way in me, O oh Lord. Have your way in me. Have your way in me, O oh Lord. Have your way in me, Father. Have your way, Jesus. We invite you to come in, Lord. Sometimes we have to give permission because we're so stubborn. We have to literally say it. God, I give you permission to have your way in my, my life because he's just waiting on you. Come on in, Jesus. Just like Pastor said, come on in, Jesus. You're welcome in this place. 
If your best friend came and knocked on your door at your house, you would say, come on in. You're welcome here. You can do whatever you want. Get into my pantry. Get into my refrigerator. That's what I tell my best friends. So if he's your best friend, you say, come on in, Jesus. You can have whatever you want. Whatever I've been holding back, whatever I have, Lord, it's yours. It belongs to you. We give it to you, Father. We give it to you this morning, Lord. So we invite you in. We invite you to come in like a flood. We invite you to come in like a fire, God. Come have your way, mighty God. Have your way, Jesus. We invite you in, Holy Spirit. We say, have your way in this place. Have your way. We invite you in, Holy Spirit. Here we go. I'm coming with the heart of a worship. I'm bringing in a brand new song. I'm ready to see the unthinkable. I'm ready for your vision.
know there's a song. It's called Heart of Worship. And it talks about when the music fades, when everything else is gone, when there's nothing else, I'm going to come back to your heart, to the Father's heart. You know, it was said a few weeks ago, God doesn't just want your Sunday morning best. He doesn't just want your glitter and your fake smile and your fake attitude and saying everything's okay. He doesn't want that because that's a lie. It really is. Ripping off the band-aid, calling it like we see it. He doesn't want your fake worship. He wants your sincere heart. He likes to see you ugly cry. He likes to see you broken because when you're broken, he can begin to repair. But when we have this facade that we have it all together, how can he come in and work? How can he work on your marriages? How can he work in your family? How can he work in your prodigals when you're busy? You're too busy putting up a face. We say, Holy Spirit, have your way. Do whatever you want to do. But sometimes doing whatever we want to do might mean that we have to say something that's going to make people mad. It's not always fun to be the one holding the microphone when you're speaking the truth. But if we put a mirror in front of us this morning and we were really honest with ourselves, we could say, my God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry where I put up a, a facade. I'm sorry, God. Holy Spirit, we invite you in. Lord, we desire your heart, Holy Spirit. And if we don't, God, reveal in us revealing us every single idol that we've put in place of you. Lord, we pray for a Holy Spirit ripping off the band-aid moment, God, where we can see what we need to do to ourselves, Lord. Where we need to be honest with you and real with you. You already know. You already know our tomorrows. You knew our yesterdays. You knew every time we would trip up and every time we would fall, and yet you still love us. close your eyes because you don't need to be focused on me at this moment you don't need to be focused on your neighbor or the person behind you or even your kid right now because I can't guarantee you the Holy Spirit is here and he is moving and he's moving in our hearts he's moving in our mindsets he's breaking off the old Holy Spirit we welcome you in nobody looking around Holy Spirit, we welcome you in. Come on, this is the altar call right now. You don't have to wait till the end of the message to get your heart right. It's right now. Right now is your opportunity. We're not promised 10 minutes from now.
Inundamos con tu presencia, Dios. Mi corazón anhela más de ti que se bien.
you to make that a prayer this morning. Just close your eyes and just say, Holy Spirit, you're welcome in my life. Come on, he won't come into a church. He's going to come into you. So give him permission, amen. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in my family. You're welcome in my children. You're welcome in my grandchildren. You're welcome in my marriage, on my job. Lord, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here today. We give place. We yield to you, Holy Spirit. Lord, this is more than word. God, this is in every action. Make us sensitive. Help us to be, Lord, quick to obey when we recognize it's your voice, it's your prompting, that you're leading us. Lord, you said all they that are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God, daughters of God. Lord, make us sensitive so we can be your sons and daughters. We hear your voice. We don't follow another voice. We know your voice. I thank you, Master, that I know your voice. I thank you that I have an ear to hear what you're saying to the church today, to us. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here to come in and to bring comfort, encouragement, correction, whatever you need. Holy Spirit, speak to me. Come on, pray with me today, church. Speak to me, Holy Spirit. I, I need an encounter with your, your, your glory. I need to, as John did, I need to see and hear that voice. Come in today, Holy Spirit. Where my attitude has, has begun to take me right or left, forgive me, cleanse me. I plead the blood of Jesus. I ask you to come. Come, Holy Spirit. Come. Come, Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Holy Spirit. You're welcome here, welcome here. Fill this house with your glory, Lord. Free God is what our hearts to be overcome by your presence. Hallelujah, Jesus. Please, come on. You are well. Lord, it's more than a song. that a minute in Revelation chapter 1 verse 10 New King James will work back there guys I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches to Ephesus to Smyrna to Pergamum to Thyatira to Sardis to Philadelphia and to Laodicea and I turned to see the voice I always thought that was strange but you know voice is indicative of a person he turned to see the voice because he recognized that voice I hadn't seen my wife in two weeks I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna go see her tonight and if I heard her voice I'd know it was her come on because we've got a relationship. And the imperative on the church today is that we recognize the voice of our Father. And we won't follow another. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. Come on. The voice of the Lord is, I, I just, I'm, these verses just keep popping in my spirit. You know, the voice of the Lord is like many waters. It's, but he turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands now gold is representative of God so he saw seven lampstands full of God and in the middle of the lampstands one like a son of man clothed in a robe reaching to the feet and girded across his breast with a golden girdle and his head and his hair were white like white wool like snow 
and his eyes were a flame of fire and his feet were like burnished bronze when it had caused been caused to glow in a furnace and his voice was like the sound of many waters and in his right hand he held seven stars and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword now we need to focus on that and his face was like the sun shining in its strength and when I saw him I fell at his feet as a dead man and he laid his right hand upon me saying do not be afraid I am the first and the last and the living one and I was dead and behold I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and of Hades write therefore the things which you have seen the things which are and the things which shall take place after these things as for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand say right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels or messengers of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So folks, when God looks at the church, he sees it gold, that all of God. That's God's ideal for you, for me. You see, the church is not a, a corporate entity. The church is people. It's us. Amen. We make up the church. And God, what he sees in, his, in the heart and the mind of the Father is that you are to be full of him. Golden. All of God. No, no impurities. Come on, this is what he's after. And to the angel, chapter 2, verse 1, to the angel or the messenger of the church in Ephesus, write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands says this, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance and that you cannot endure evil man. Now, you know, that ought to scare you. It says, I know what you're doing. I want you to hear the voice of the Spirit today. I know your deeds. I know what you're doing. Now, some of you, that ought to strike fear. Come on. But friend, you got to understand that, you know, he, he knew what you did before you did it. He says, I know right where you're living. Your toil and your perseverance and that you cannot endure evil men and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. But I have this against you. And right there, you, you know, most of us would just fall out. And he's like, yeah, you know, you've done really good, but I've got this against you. <sighs> oh, God. And immediately your mind starts looking and, you know, what has he got against me? Well, I, you know, and you run out of fingers and toes. Come on. And friends, it's not all the, all the things. It's the root. I have this against you. You've left your first love. You don't love me like you used to love me. Now, love's not a feeling. But love is born out in how we act. How we treat our wives, men. How we respond to our husband's leadership, ladies. Love is born out in our actions, not on our words, and how we act. Verse 5, remember therefore from whence you have fallen, and repent, and do the deeds that you did at first, or else I'm coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place, unless you repent. Amen? Yet this you, ha you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So he came back in and told him one more time, you know, I see, you, you got some mighty fine points. But folks, he's not after 80% on this test. 
He wants all of you. Come on. Can you hear the voice of God in, in His Word today? I want all of you. I'm not going to compete with all these other things. I, I was praying down here just a little bit ago, knowing what I was going to read to you. And I began to pray, God, make me the message that I'm about to preach to others. Amen? Make me the message. Don't let me just say words up here. See, when we just get up here and say words, it's got no power, no ability to change a life. But when we become that message, when I read these verses, I, I get under conviction. And you, you don't need to run past that point, this point. We can go into the depth and the, all the beautiful lessons and theological propositions from this verse. But folks, let's just hear what the Spirit is saying today. You've left your first love. Something, the, the, the work has become more important than the ministry. Come on. The mission. The ministry's can become more important than the ministry. The mission. I'll, help me, Lord. The ministry has become more important than the mission. The mission is to rescue the perishing, to, to bring people out of a pit. Father, your word is life-giving. And Lord, just in reading it, I know that Holy Spirit, you're taking it to our hearts and lives and you're confronting us with a truth that we've known. It's not anything new. There are many people in here that, that are experiencing distance. And that's not at all your will. And there's a deep of God calling to the deep of the heart of this church today. Deep calls unto the deep. You're asking us to come back to where we've fallen from. Come back to the first love. Come back to the zeal, the excitement. To not, not allow this controversy between Mary and Martha. One's got to work and one's going to worship. The Lord, teach us to sit at your feet again. We love you. We thank you. Master, you told me 18 years ago that this is a candlestick church. And looking from the outside, I thought it was anything but. But I see what you are doing in the community through this house. And I thank you for it. I thank you, Master, for your hand upon us for good. I thank you for the faithfulness of those that have gone on before us to, to sacrifice in building and establishing this, this church on this street corner. And for all that, that, that those have endured to pay the bills and keep the lights on and, and to love on people when they're hurting, even though they're hurting themselves. I, I thank you, Master, that this candlestick here at 709 West Mulberry is shining brighter and brighter every day. And I give you glory for it. And I thank you for what you're doing. Bless this people here this morning, Master. And allow your word to prevail in every one of our hearts. I ask in the mighty name of Jesus. And the church said, Amen. Come on, can you give him a hand clap of praise because he's worthy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, team. Amen. So when you look at these seven churches, I'm going to talk to you this morning about what, what is a candlestick church. Right? You know, some of these Christianese words get confusing. You know, we, we, we speak in a lot of uh, uh, jargon, right? We got, it, in my company, we have probably 20 or 30 different acronyms. And I catch myself using a whole sentence without ever speaking a word. Seriously. You know, 
I'm an SME and uh, the, the PHA has revealed that, you know, in the, <laughs> you know, just, just all this jargon, right, that we use. And in, in church, we can use a lot of jargon that, 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 you know, we, to the un, un, unlearned, to those that don't spend their life in this stuff, we miss it. And friends, this is something we dare not miss, is that, that to, to be a candlestick is to be a chosen body through which God pours himself into that community. That's a candlestick church. A candlestick church is one that represents him well. And, and, and the Lord gets pretty ticked off at people that claim and name the name of Jesus but don't represent him. You know, we, 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 we put up a, a misrepresentation of, of who he is and what he is. And, and, you know, you read, I encourage you, I'm not preaching this whole uh, chapter 2 and 3, but, uh, but you go home, we're going to kind of hit the, hit the high points, but you go home and read over these verses and you can see that the Lord is jealous for his church. So you be real careful before you put your tongue on the church. Eh, well, the church is you know. Yeah, he died for the church. He's coming back for the church. Amen. And he disciplines his church. So it, what he's saying in these chapters is it's not our current condition that matters to God. Where you're at right now today is not the important thing. It's what direction are you headed. Come on. It doesn't matter where you are. You can be stuck in a rut. You can be, you can be wrapped up in sin and bondage to drugs and to sex and to anything else you want to think of. That's not the important thing. The important thing is what's the direction? Where are you headed? He calls out to Adam, Adam, where are you? Well, I thought he was God, didn't he? Know? Yeah, he knew. He wanted to know, Adam, do you realize the turn that you've made? Do you recognize what is occurring in your life, church? Do you recognize where you're at today? He tells Elijah in the cave, what are you doing here, Elijah? Do you recognize that you've gone 140 miles in the wrong direction? I mean, you go read it and you look at a map, you know, uh, you know here was the confrontation with the, the uh, prophets of Baal, and he goes all the way over here and hides in a cave, and God comes and says, not here, here. Completely in the opposite direction. Elijah, where are you? And friends, there are times in our life that God will just stop and he will ask you, where are you? Not because he doesn't know. But he's trying to birth an awareness in us. Where, what, what's, the, what's the trajectory that I'm on? I'm a long-range shooter, and, and being an, I was an archer and, you know, when I was uh, in high school, and I was just obsessed with shooting bows and arrows, and that was before it was cool. You know, I was always just a little bit ahead of the curve, you know, and, uh, you know so I, I got out of it when they started coming out with all those compound bows. And so I shot the old green fiberglass bow that the arrow rest was actually, you know, the, the I mean, the handle was the arrow rest. Any, anybody shoot bows in here? Let me see. All right, well, cool. Y'all know exactly what I'm talking about then. And that, you know, it's because I shot so often, had, of course, those old bows had no sights, right? It was all instinctive. And you could just point at a distance, and, I could, and I'd have to choose from one of my five arrows that I had. I was a poor boy. I had one, one wooden arrow with a fixed broadhead, so I didn't shoot it very much. I had two aluminum arrows and two fiberglass arrows. And depending on where the target was, that's what arrow I would grab. And I knew just, it's like, that's crazy. But you know, a, a bow and arrow, arrow kind of has a trajectory like that, right? And you have to understand just how far to elevate. Well, then move into today in long range shooting, you know, we're shooting out at 600 and 1200 yards. It's like, man, this really helps me to understand what's happening with this bullet as it goes through the, you know, I know that I've got to look not just at the target, but I've got to look above the target and make sure because it's sometimes at 1,200 yards, we're aiming 30 and 40 feet above the target. And sometimes, you know, 10, 15 yards to the either side of the target because of the wind. And so that bullet is actually doing this coming into the target. It's crazy. But the trajectory, you've got to understand the trajectory and the question is that, that, that you know, that uh, the risen master is asking this church is, you know, you, you know, you need to understand where you're at and how that is going to direct your life. Now, these people, he really didn't have too much bad to say about them. They were, 
man, they were serving God and they were, they were doing great things and they were going for it, but the motive was off. He said, man, you, well, let, let, let's just go back and read it. He said, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance. You cannot endure evil men. You put to the test those who, who, uh, who call themselves apostles, and they are not. You found them to be false. You have persevered, and you have perseverance, and you've endured for my name's sake, and you've not grown weary. Like, dude, you're killing it. But, but all of the work, the ministry has become your focus. And you've left the first love. You've left me. Can we lose Jesus in the church? Come on. Can, can the, the, the ministry become more important than the mission? Yeah. yeah. How do we get that back? Man, fall in love with him all over again. Every time we come together and we get in a worship service, that is an opportunity for you to just to fall all in love with Jesus all over again. It's a time for you to leave all of the junk behind. I get, I, sometimes I just get, and now sometimes it takes a little work, right? You know, pulling things aside and putting it down like, oh, yeah, I know y'all don't have those issues, but as a pastor, I have those issues. You know, to put stuff back and just to really focus on him, come on. But all along, and, we, and the moment we start yielding to him, all of a sudden we hear him. Oh, isn't that gorgeous? It's beautiful. So the, 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 the point is that before we get too deep into this message, I want you to understand is that where your current condition today is really not the important thing. It, it, you know, it doesn't matter how far you have fallen. That is not the issue. What is your trajectory this morning? Well, in what direction are you moving? Are you moving toward God or are you moving away from Him? That's it. That's all. <clears throat> recognition, C.S. Lewis said this, recognition of your own errors is the beginning of sanctification. Amen. When we, when, when we recognize that we're going in the wrong direction. So today, if you will, allow me to be the voice of the Holy Spirit for a few moments. And let me ask you, spiritually speaking, what direction are you headed? Amen. There's no such thing as stagnation. You're either growing closer to God or you're gr drifting away from Him. There's not much middle ground there. So let's look this morning briefly at what the hallmarks of a true church in the city that Jesus is looking for. What is a candlestick church? Now, in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, there's seven churches that he's going to speak to. Ephesus. Uh, for some of you, that might this, you, you know, you, the Bible is not your first language. Uh, Ephesus is who the, the book of Ephesians was written to. Kind of works that way. Uh, but Ephesus was the gateway to Asia. It's kind of like California is today. Whatever starts in California is going to eventually find its way down here in South Texas. Amen or oh me. <clears throat> and and, and j just some cool things about uh, 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 cool things about it is that that in in uh, in Ephesus, Timothy was the pastor there for decades. Paul's associate. It's pretty cool. Smyrna was a town about thirty miles down the road. There's a guy in there that was a pastor by the name of Stratus. And uh, Timothy, that was Timothy's older brother. So you think, you think that Timothy and his brother Stratus, that they kind of had a little competition about whose church was bigger? Well, Timothy was winning that one. And so when you read about, you know, uh, you know John uh, or Jesus speaking through John to, to the church at Smyrna, you kind of, some of that comes through. Pergamum, it was a royal city in the financial center of Asia. Its pastor was Antipas, who was, who was martyred, as, and the text will tell you that, and later it was pastored by a man by the name of Gaius, just trying to bring some humanity to these, to these churches. Thyatira was a town that was constructed to protect Pergamum because Pergamum is where the king and the governors lived, and it was the financial center. So Thyatira was probably kind of like the sacrificial lamb, you know, right? <laughs> you know, they're there to be a buffer when the enemies come in to attack them. Boy, would you want to live there, pastor there? Hey, yeah, look, y'all are just y'all are going to die, <laughs> but we're going to y'all are just there to slow the attacking army down so that they don't get to uh, to Pergamum without the rest of us knowing it. Sardis uh, was where the richest man in the world at his time lived, King Croesus. 
And uh, that's, that, that really speaks of what, what the Lord is speaking to the church at Sardis. Philadelphia was known as the city of the open door to the east. And the Lord will say to Philadelphia, I have set before you an open door. It, it's, it's just cool. It was the last one. If you're, if you're going to go east, you're going to go through Philadelphia. And from there, everything opens up. And then there's Laodicea, a very wealthy city. They, the, the excavations are showing 4,500 shops in the city of Laodicea. And all the ladies said, Amen. Amen. Shop till you drop in Laodicea. And so their church was big and very successful, had a lot of wealthy people. And the Lord, you know, the Lord says that you say, I'm rich and I'm increased with goods. They had the best looking church in, in the whole region. But he said, but you don't realize you're poor, blind, miserable, and naked. Very telling when you, when you do a little research on the condition that these churches were in. If the Lord was going to write a, church, a letter to Central Assembly in 2004, what do you think he'd say to us? Yeah. He said, I know thy works. The Greek here in know thy works is from personal observation. Jesus is walking the aisles today, and he's observing everything that's going on. And he says, I know your works. Now, he's not talking to the assemblies of God. He's talking to you. If I could call your names, I would. But it's, it's you as individuals, but it's how you affect the, 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 the corporate body. Just because you're not the head doesn't mean you're not a part of the body. Just because you're not the foot, the hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. We're all a part of the body. And, and if one part of the body is sick, the whole body suffers. And so Jesus is not just, and see, when I read this for years, when I read it for years, I just say, well, that's just the church. No, it's me as the church. It's you in the church. And he's, we say, he's very particular about the church. You don't put your hand on the church, but that the, the master sitting at the right hand of the Father doesn't pay very close attention to what's going on. I want you to know he died for the church. And he said in Ephesians 5, he's coming back for the church like a, bride coming for, like a bridegroom coming for the bride. Amen. And he, he's very concerned about the condition that he finds her in. So it's not just us as a corporate whole, though it is a corporate, but he's talking about how each individual member can affect the perception of that church. And so, man, you know, here, here this first church is kicking it. They're doing good. They're rocking and rolling. He said, you're, you're doing good. Your theology is sound. But you've lost sight of the reason and the purpose of it. I know thy works. That ought to scare you. <clears throat> Then, uh, and I said, or John turned to see the voice, and instead of seeing the voice, the first thing he saw was the candlesticks, because that's the focus of the master. Uh, candlesticks, all of gold, as I already said, that is, that is, that is being, it's not perfect, but they belong to God because they were founded on him. Amen? How many of you have, have, have heard about across town, the perfect church? Come on, y'all know that church. The the church that people that come through here are on their way to. Because they're going to come in here, they're going to find out we're not perfect. Well, we got bumps and warts and we got issues and, you know, you, you got a redneck for a pastor and, you know, all that stuff. Sometimes I slaughter the English language. Sometimes I just put my foot in my mouth, you know. But, uh, you know, it's, but that other church, that, that, that's the one that you really want to go to. Come on, are you listening to me? That, that there is no perfect church. And I know you've all heard the cliche, if you find the perfect church, don't go there because you'll ruin it. It will suddenly find imperfection because a, a church is not an organization. A church is a body of believers. And, and come on, every one of you are a part of this thing that Jesus died for. And it's, he's not rebuking these seven churches because he does not love them. He hasn't taken, he, you, the, the vision is not Jesus walking around the candlesticks and knocking them over and throwing them out of the way. No, he does that to another group of believers. But those that belong to him, 
He loves them, and he's giving a genuine look and assessment. It's like, I, I'm looking for your trajectory. Where are you headed? Let me tell you something, folks. I, I'm, I'm, as, as your pastor, I've got a lot of weaknesses, and God brings men around me like our, pa our associate pastor to help me and these young preachers to help me. Thank God for it. Uh, we got a lot of issues here. We're not perfect. But one thing that we're trying to major on is our pursuit of him and everything that he wants from us. I simply want to please him. I love to please you. I don't like it when you don't like me. I want to be liked by everybody. But before I ever give that a consideration, it's what does he want? What does he want? And friends, that ought to be yours. Your heartbeat should be, Lord, you know, if I say this to my brother and sister, is, I know it may offend them, but what, what are you going to think about it? You know, we just, we just see in the, in the church world today this big controversy between these two big-name preachers and, and how horrible that is, and, and, and everybody's got a different take about it. It's like, look, forget about what other people think about this thing. What does God think about it? I got a phone call yesterday. So they at, somebody was asking me because their, their church was, you know, like a bigger church, maybe close to being a mega church. You know, sent out a, and, and they attend a satellite church, and they sent out a letter to everybody about this controversy. And, and uh, she's like, what, uh, you know, what do you think about that? Y'all know the, the, the guy, the, they, the men's conference, they did the, they brought the male stripper guy out, whatever, in a church. Just God help us. And, and, you know, was the man that confronted it, was he right? Was he wrong? I said, that, that's irrelevant. Right? Now, because I, I understand both sides. I understand that he should have gone to the pastor privately, but the deed wasn't done in private. The deed was done in public. Yeah. And, it, and if it had been just public, that's one thing, but it was done in the church with, with you know, five, six, ten thousand captive men, and so... Those men needed to hear the truth. So I see both sides of the, of the controversy. But the pro forget the controversy alone. Why do we have to entertain people? Why do we have to try, to try to pay people off to get them to come to church? Let me tell you something. If you love him, you're loving his body. And if you love God and you love the church, you're going to find a group of people to fellowship with. And the truth is going to be preached. And you're going to be benefited. You're going to be blessed. So forget all that. It's like, why do we need to do other things to entice people to come to Jesus? It's because we've divorced ourselves from the very thing that God put in the church to entice men and women. That's the power of the Holy Ghost. When we put the Holy Ghost in the back room, we put the stripper in the front room. Come on. But when we bring the Holy Spirit in the church, yes, people are going to get nervous. I've never seen that before. Get over yourself. We serve a supernatural God. And if he doesn't show himself in the church, then we got to bring other things in. And the reason he doesn't show up in the church is because we have lost our first love. Because the ministry becomes more important than the mission how many, we got some empty chairs over here. Oh my goodness, how am I going to get these chairs full? Oh, if I bring a male stripper in here, that'll work. I don't even understand that. <laughs> but that's how this dude thought. We got it because if I'm a professional pastor, my, my salary depends on whether those chairs are full or not. How can I get them in here? The curse of the church is the, is the professional ministry. I, I'm convinced of that. Paul was a tent maker. I feel pretty good in that. Amen. I, 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 I'm not, a, not opposed. I was full-time. Amen. You can be full-time. That's good. But don't you ever start thinking like a businessman. This is not a business. You left your first love. All right. So let's look at the characteristics. I, what I did, I just, I just kind of went and, and I looked through all of the churches this week. That, the, that they were to, so Ephesus, it's a gateway church. We call it gateway. <clears throat> That's what, probably was the name of it. Um, is there a gateway church? I think there is. That kind of, probably, I don't know who it is, okay? So I'm not pointing at them. But uh, they, they were commended for their works, they, uh, the church that worked. They toil, patient endurance. They hated evil. They test all who preach, so they were sound theologically. And they didn't grow weary when they went through stuff. Amen. That's a characteristic of a candlestick church. Things that Jesus said was good. Smyrna, 
They were a poor church. They were currently undergoing tribulation, and Jesus promised them there's more coming. I believe I'm going to Gateway. I'm going to leave that one alone. <laughs> Come on. He said, but then there's more coming. But he said, you're not rich like many around you, but you're rich in other ways. They were being slandered by the town's folks. And, and again, there's the promise of more tribulation coming. Pergamum, that was the place where Satan's seat is. They were accused of following Balaam's error. They were faithful followers of Jesus, though they were living on the brink of hell. And they kept the faith and did not shy away, even though their pastor was martyred. Now, if somebody came in here and murdered me for being a Christian, some of y'all would run, and I got that. Some of, the, some of you other ones will be in prison because you go start slaughtering all their family, and I get that. And then the rest of you would be genuine Christians. <laughs> anyway, Thyatira was growing in grace, but they were tolerant of Jezebel. Now listen to the commendations. This is what they did right. They worked. They had love. They had faith in Christ. They had service, patient endurance, and they were growing in all metrics toward God. But he said, here's the deal. You're tolerating Jezebel who is corrupting people in the church. I'm concerned about the trajectory of the church. The initial measure was they're growing in all of the metrics toward uh, what God wanted. But the Lord was pointing out this little bitty thing here. It's just one person. You know, you know, we can just kind of isolate this one and just, you know, you know, maybe God will change her, him, whatever it was. And the Lord is saying, no, you're tolerating something that I don't tolerate. Is Jesus tolerant? See, this is, this is cutting edge stuff here, y'all. This is right out of the book of Revelation, and it is right out of Fox News, amen, yesterday. Is Jesus tolerant? Well, he told the woman caught in the very act of adultery, I don't condemn you. Hallelujah. He's tolerant. Oh, y'all read your Bible. He said, I don't condemn you because he doesn't, again, he's not concerned with what you, the position you find yourself in today. He's concerned about the trajectory, the spiritual trajectory of your life. She was broken. He said, I don't condemn you, but stop it. That is biblical tolerance. Amen. We don't condemn folks that are caught up in sin. Amen. But we move them in the right direction. Come on. Let me tell you something. If, 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 if I were to go on the evangelistic field, I would be a poor man. Because I'd be going to these churches and I'd be talking to folks that are, that are fornicating in the church. That are committing adultery in the church saying, you got to stop this. And the pastor would say, oh, no, 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 no. We're, God is love. He loves it. He does love you, but he loves you too much to leave you the way he finds you. And so Jesus says, I don't condemn you, but stop it. There's a better way to live. The, when God says don't do something, it's not to keep you from having fun. Just look at me. Maybe I'm just too stupid to know it no better, but I'm going to have fun wherever I go. Amen. All right, well, let me get off of that. So, where did I, where'd I land up? That was Thyatira, the tolerant of Jezebel. In Sardis, they had a reputation. <laughs> this one hit me. And I have to pray over this church all the time. Had a reputation of life, but they were really dead. You see, a lot of churches are living on their reputation. It, it bothers me to point back to when, you know, revival was really moving in this house. And I always walk over here, I don't know, because I guess I, the bass was here, I was playing over here, but this was like, like the zone I watched, and it just would blow me away watching God move in our services. I hate that I have to point back to a few years ago. I'm not talking 40 years ago, I'm just talking about a few years back, but I want to see God move like that again. There should, uh, you know, I know there's an ebb and flow to this spiritual life. Is there to yours? Or are you sometimes more on fire for God than you are today? And, oh, boy, there's a word in here for you. 
<laughs> he wants you to be hot or cold. Okay, I didn't mean to go there, but I, I'm, I'm trying not to hurt you today. I'm trying to help you. Philadelphia was the church of the open door. <clears throat> he had nothing bad to say to that church. He said they had good works. They kept the word in spite of the, their strength was almost gone. They did not deny Jesus' name in spite of perse persecution, and they had patient, patient endurance. And the last church that I just referred to was Laodicea. They were a rich, lukewarm church, and Jesus found nothing good to say about them. Now, when you, when you just do a quick survey, so if we, if we collate the finer points of the seven churches, God, four times, patient endurance. Patient endurance. How many of you have patient endurance? Raise your hand. Come on. Thank you, brother. There's one honest. There's two honest men. When I read this, I'm thinking, uh, let me add, Paul and Tao and Jimmy and Linda, would you, you guys stand? Yeah, the four of you stand. Uh, Retha, I'll throw you in there too. Who else, who else has been here? Y'all stand up. Who else has been here like forever? <clears throat> if you've been here 30 years or more, stay, did I miss anybody? April, yeah, st stand up, April, and you can stand up. You're all right. Now, come on, give them a hand. Now, y'all just stay here. I'm going to use you as an illustrated sermon just a minute. These people were here when I got here. They've been here... I, I told Paul this morning, I said, Paul, I said, I want to, he brought me a cup of coffee in my office, and, and uh, I, I said, brother, I want to thank you, and I, I said it to Jimmy, I think, yesterday or day before yesterday, I want to thank you for your faithfulness. Go ahead and sit down, y'all are old, I know you get tired of that. <laughs> but I, I told Paul this morning, I said, I thank you. I said, for your, your faithfulness. And, and I know it wasn't easy staying at this church when, you know, when the thing cratered and, and, and everything was so horrible. And, and he, he told me this. He said, Pastor, it was, it was those folks that mentored me, those, those, those old folks that built this church, the founding members that poured in there. Sister, brother and sister, well, no, Sister Rich, yeah. I had to think of her name for a minute. But the riches, and I could go on and on, the McKinleys and, and, and others that, you know, man, they just, they patiently endured. And they watched new pastors come in with great vision, and they watched them go, and they stayed. And the next one would come in, and they just continued. It didn't matter what pastor came in, what the style of worship was, or what happened here. They just were faithful because they were called here, and they were, they were rock solid. Patient endurance is a, is a hallmark of a candlestick church. God is looking for men and women who will just be faithful. Just be patient. Just, you know what? I, I'm here. The church can run a thousand or it can run ten. Doesn't matter to me because God's called me here. Come on, y'all. And I thank God that y'all come and you hang around in spite of me, some of you. Some of you hang around because I'm here. But if I'm gone after I leave and you leave too, then you're not the ones he's looking for to build the church on. He's looking for men and women that are called of God, that are going to stay and be faithful and be building blocks for this thing in the city. Amen. Because the candlestick is a light to the community. And I understand God, you know, people, people come. And he told us that people are going to come through here. They're going to, some of them are going to stay for a season and go. Because they're going to get what they need. And they're going to go. I, I, I got that. But at some point, ladies and gentlemen, in this room today, wherever you are, wherever you wind up, at some point, your calling is to help the church that God sends you to, to be a candlestick church. That means you're going to have to put down roots. You're going to have to be faithful. You're going to have to go to Sunday school and Wednesday night service and Sunday night service and, and prayer meeting. Thank you, Brother Paul. Amen. It's like, why, why, why is that necessary? Because that is the thing that God looks for from a group of people that he's going to build a church on. Man, I, I hadn't been here when, when the revival kicked off after I'd been here about a year and a half. And, and man, I, I got pictures of this one service. Every chair was full. We had people sitting on the aisles. When oh, uh, uh, that, that, that old boy from, that wrote the book, uh, uh, they told me that, anyways, the book about, he interviewed all the Azusa Street uh, uh, survivors and Wonderful, sir. Oh, we had a tremendous service. And everybody said, Pastor, we need to build a bigger building. I'm like, we ain't building on all of this. I'm not going to ask you, but if I ask for a show of hands, the people that were in their services, probably about 30 or 40 of you. Hello? 
You, 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 you go spend $6 million to build a, a church on 30 or 40 people, you're going to be sadly mistaken. <laughs> you're going to have a rough time paying that puppy off. Yeah. You see, that you got to understand that, that Jesus, he, it, it says of Jesus, he didn't commit himself to many men because he knows what's in a man. He's looking for people with patient endurance. And that's what, that's what he's called. The church is all of gold. That is his ideal. That is what he's calling you to. He's calling you to be faithful. He's calling you to stick, amen, when everything else around you wants to go in another direction. He said you need to be faithful. You need to be patient and endure, amen? All right, let's read some more. Where did I go here? Patient endurance. Number two, three times specifically, and one or two times it was inferred, he said, you've got works. I know your works. He liked it. Say work. You do know work is not a curse. Amen. You know, that's what really got me into the kingdom. When I, when I got born again and got into church, I felt like I needed to work. I, I, I cut, before I ever got in the pulpit, years before I ever got in the pulpit, I cut trees, I, I, I did plumbing, I, you know, I, I, I swept, I mowed, I did all, anything I could find to do because I love God's church and I love to be a part of it. Three times he said it, it means their, your lifestyle, your character, amen. You don't go around town gossiping. Oh man, my pastor, he preached the most boring sermon on, on the candlestick church, well, it's only born if you're not hearing what the Spirit is saying. But if you're hearing what the Holy Ghost is saying, it's speaking life. Will that be corrective? Yes, absolutely. He's correcting me while I'm talking to you. Amen. So it means lifestyle. Our works is our character. Amen. What does this city think about your lifestyle? Amen. I've told people before, look, don't tell them you go to this church. Coming back from the airport yesterday, listening, I, 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 was, I was asking, man, tell me the stories in Jordan and Kesa and, and, uh, and Michael and uh, uh, Rachel. They were telling me about, about this stuff and, and how Pastor Lapenga in Zambia told them, said, you, know, you guys are just so easy to work with because they just wanted to serve. They didn't say, well, you know, the air conditioner is not working in my room. And, you know, I, <laughs> you know, you expect me to eat those fried sardines that look like green beans? They sent me a picture of that, and I immediately texted, no, 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 no. But it's like, it just, it, it, people are amazed when they get around real Christians how easy Christians are to get along with. Oh, God, I need to say that again. This side's going to, come on, shout with me over here. Come on. Real Christians are easy to get along with. Yeah, yeah. See, woo, see y'all got some. Real Christians don't demand that their water be a certain temperature. <laughs> Real Christians just want to get in here and worship and serve. Yeah. Lord, this works pretty good. I like this. <laughs> Amen. And I told him, I said, you represented us so wonderfully. You know, that now our works are known in Zambia. Hey, you want a you work crew? You get them from Central because they're not going to complain. Amen? Yeah. Glory to God. I love that. It, I was so proud. I, I, I wept, you know, when I was getting texts and pictures and, and hearing stories before they got back. It was just beautiful. Uh, uh, three times uh, we're talking about what, what Jesus is considering, amen, reasons to leave that candlestick in place. Sound doctrine. Oh, that's so boring. Oh, no, it isn't. It's wonderful. Because when you get your doctrine right, man, I mean, life is the, is the, is the benefit of it. Life is just manifest three times. And, and, and once or twice, he said, you know, you rooted out those false teachers. How many like that ministry? Some people like it, but they, they need to go back to the, to the first church and not leave your first love. Amen? I was to the church of Ephesus, right? <clears throat> You know, some people, you know, if any correction we need to do, we do, we need to do from love. And the last one that I, I, I wrote here in the collating, they did not grow weary. They didn't give up. Six of the seven churches said, you've not grown weary. Any of y'all feel tired this morning? Just, just tired of what's going on in this, in this world. And, you know, can I continue to live for Jesus in this messed up upside down world? 
Amen. A candlesticks church won't grow weary. Now, how in the world do you keep, you keep it up when, when everything you see on neat TV and the newspaper, if, do they still make newspapers? But uh, you know, Facebook and, and Instagram or whatever of them grams are, where everything is, is, is anti-Christ and anti-the church. How do, you, how do you not grow weary? Because you're in love with Jesus. Because I love him. Amen. Because I've just fallen in love with him. And then he gave commands to the churches, to Ephesus. He said, remember where you used to be spiritually. Repent and do it again. Do me a favor. Turn to your neighbor and say, do you remember or do you know where you're at spiritually? Just don't, don't wait for an answer. Just, do you know where you're at spiritually? That's the, where are you, Adam? Why are you here, Elijah? Right? Central, do you, what are you doing here? Do you know where you're at spiritually? Remember from where you have fallen. If you're not growing closer to God, you are getting further away from him. There's no middle ground. Come on, the, the, you know, it's the, the tide is never still. It's either moving out or it's moving in. Amen? And I want you to catch the wave, folks. There is a move of God coming into this nation today where the wind of the Spirit is pushing, is pushing those who are listening to the voice of the Holy Ghost, pushing us closer to the kingdom, closer to the things of God, and those that hear Him are going to respond. But you have to do an honest assessment of yourself. Where am I and how did I get here? To Smyrna, he said, don't fear suffering and be faithful unto death. Oh, I don't ever want to take their place. But if I do, God, give me the, the, the supernatural grace. Amen? I prayed over our team. I, I didn't say it out loud before they left. I, I did text it to Hank, and he didn't take instruction. So we still got five people over there. I got to send, I'm going to send it to, to the others. But I have a, let's just say I have a contact that they do threat assessments around the world for, for major ministries that travel worldwide and do different stuff. And uh, he, he told me, he said, Brad, if you ever go, you know, you let me know before y'all go and I'll give you a threat assessment. So I forgot about it until the week before they left. And I'm like, hey, we're going to Zambia. We're stopping in Qatar, uh, you know, what do you, and he immediately texted back. He said, I would avoid Qatar if at all possible. <laughs> well, it's not possible. He said, ISIS is, is uh, basing their headquarters in there. They're looking for opportunities, uh, you know, to exploit. He said, so if you, if, if it, if it's, is, if it's, if you just have to go there, don't leave the airport. I'm like, well, I feel really good about this. <laughs> so I told everybody, I said, bring you a pillow and a blanket. We're not going to leave the airport. Well, I didn't, y'all know, I, I got kicked off. I didn't get to go because of my passport issues. And so they all went. And some of them stayed in the airport and the other one stayed off site. I'm like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> and I mean, when they got to Qatar, they were going through immigration. And, and uh, uh, Jordan, I called your name earlier, so you know I know who you are. <laughs> Jordan, Jordan, because he kind of looks that way. I don't know. <laughs> Stand up, Jordan. We were joking with him before we left. Yeah. Said, all you need is a little rag on your head, and they're going to tell. <laughs> he, get, he gets to the airport going through customs in Qatar. They do his fingerprints and looks at him, takes his, his passport away from him and says, follow me. And, oh, yeah, they said, you're black, blacklisted. You can't leave the airport. It's like, oh, Jesus, Jesus. They, they text me, do you know anybody in immigration? I'm like. No, but I know somebody a little higher. Yeah. Yeah. I started praying in the name of Jesus. I sent word to my buddy that does these threat assessments, and he said, he said it's probably just a, mis a misapplication, you know, a fingerprint. He didn't say fingerprint. He thought maybe a facial recognition thing. He said, just wait it out. He, uh, he'll ca catch another plane tomorrow. And they wait, worked it out in less than an hour, so it was cool. But <sighs> it's like, Lord, I don't think I'm ready to, for Jordan to be a martyr over there. But you know, if, if and, and this is what he said. So my buddy, in the first response, I said, you know, so we're doing this, what should we do? He said, I wouldn't do it if I were you, but if, if God's sending you, then you're okay. Yeah. I'm like, roger that. 
And I didn't find out till yesterday, Jordan's mother, she was upset when I got kicked off the plane. As, why, does, why does God protect in Pastor Brad and not my son? <laughs> it's just how our brain works, right? But friends, you have to understand that when we take the name of Christ, we are expected to be willing to put our life on the line. And if we are called by God... Amen. To go to other nations and to preach the gospel, we've got to be willing to hazard our life. But most of us are afraid to talk to anybody in Walmart. Come on, church. We have an opportunity. We've been afforded, and we've got to be willing. If Jesus was going to talk to the American church, he would rebuke us for our, for our fear that it's completely unfounded. What are you going to do? Reject me or unfriend me on Facebook? Oh, God. You know, when getting pulled off a plane in Qatar could be death or worse. Yeah. So pray for Bethany and Guillermo and Hank and uh, Sherry and Kay. They're, they're still there. <clears throat> All right. Where was I? Repent. For, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was Smyrna. Pergamum, repent for conforming to the world in sexual and spiritual sin. That's Jezebel. Right? God has very definite ideas about sex, y'all. And those ideas are not to, to, to deny you pleasure. When he created men and women, he said, this is very good. Not just good. He put the, the modifier in front of it. Very good. You know, guys, come on. Amen. Come on, man. Amen. All right. So he's got very definite ideas about sexual things and spiritual things, and he knows how closely related they are. Sexual sin can soon become spiritual. It can open up doors to demons, and you've got to be careful. So he said you need to repent for conforming to the world's idea, their, their, their culture's idea that they were in. Thyatira, he said, hold fast until I come. And if you've given in to that Jezebel spirit, he basically said there's not much hope to you. You go back and you read that letter to Thyatira. He says, those of you that have not been caught away, then, then you know, I can help you. But he had nothing to say to those that had given in to that spirit. That's, that, that's terrifying. And so let, let me, okay, the Holy Spirit has just prompted me. I just kind of hit that and ran. So let me, come, let me back up a half a step and say this again. That, that the sexual immorality in this nation, right, the things that, that all your friends think is okay, if you give in to that, if you open the door for that, you are opening your door to demon possession. And there may not be hope for you. You, you go back and you read that letter to Thyatira. This is, the Lord's, this is the Lord's message to the last day church. We've got to understand what he's saying. Sardis, he said, wake up, remember from where you've fallen and repent. In Philadelphia, he said, take advantage of that open door. He didn't have any rebukes. In Laodicea, he said, do you hear me knocking? Can you hear me? See, he, he said, behold, I say, he had nothing good to say to Laodicea. He said, uh, I stand at the door and I knock, and if you'll open the door, I will come in. So my question to you today, are you hearing the Lord knocking at the door of the church? He's knocking. That's not the sinner's door. He's talking to you. He's talking to me. He's talking to the church. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you go back and read, he said, this is to the church at Laodicea. He's not talking to the, 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 the perverts in Laodicea. He's talking to the church. He says, I'm standing outside and I'm knocking trying to get back in the church. And if you'll hear and open the door, I will come in. So what, to close, what is a candlestick church? It's a church that has a deep and an abiding love for Christ that overflows into patient endurance, good works, and theological soundness with a spiritual discernment and a holy boldness that calls out false prophets, rebukes sin, and loves the lost in their community. That's what a candlestick church is. So as I was... You know, I, I love it when the Lord gives me a, a, a thought because I have a lot of time to really take in uh, input. And so, in closing, 
Is there anybody here today that you're just, I've, I've already said, anybody, tired and weary? Jesus said, come to me. I've had like at least three or four people in conversations this week, Christians, they're just like, I'm just, they're, they're weary of all of the turmoil and division and strife that's in this world out here. And they're like, is it, you know, I'm just tired of it all. I want you, if that's you, I want you to hear Jesus cupping his hands and saying, come to me. Come to me, because in him you're going to find rest. In Jesus, you'll find rest. All the world can be going topsy-turvy. They're going to continue to do what they do, but you don't have to be affected by it. You can find rest in him. How many of you, and don't raise your hand, but if you're here today and you feel distance from God, amen, that's, that's some of these churches, then you need to return to your first love. That's Ephesus. They were, doing, they were in church, and every, every visible input said they were right on target. But there was distance between them and God because they didn't love him like they used to love him. And the, and the, the command was just repent and do the first works again. I was talking to somebody that, uh, uh, about that this week, and I was re recalled what Pat, what Brother Clendenin told us years ago, said, you know, that, uh, you know that, 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 that prodigal, you can come in and you can enjoy all the presence of God for a few years, and then you backslide and go out. He said, he'll take that backslider back, but don't you expect those feelings to come back right away. He said, he said it'll take time for you to prove not to him, but to yourself. Come on. The, the, the thing is, folks, he's willing. He's opening his arms. He's saying, come to me, amen, all you who are laboring are heavy laden. He's asking you to come in to the church. He's talking to the church. Come on in, amen. But, but don't, don't expect the feelings to come rushing back because sometimes that doesn't happen. Are you bound by sin and worldliness? That's some of the churches we talked about here today. Then you need to repent and turn from sin and from Satan and turn back to God, amen. And that, that, that should be the cry of the church to every person that walks in the door. If, you, if you're bound by sin, we're not here to condemn you. We're here to help you, to show you there's a better way. Amen? That the attraction to the church is not the preaching and the singing. The attraction is this Christ that loves us. He gave himself for us, and there is freedom in Jesus. Amen? If you're dabbling in sexual sin, pornography, homosexuality, fornication, Amen. That's that spirit of Jezebel that was spoken of. If you continue to practice these things after hearing this message today, there may be no hope for you tomorrow. Come on. You see, I, and it's something that I say all the time and people just kind of run past it. The loudest he's going to speak to you in conviction of sin is that first time. You're going to hear it, and the more you say no, that no is registered on a little cell in your brain. And every time you say no, it, it digs that, that, that groove a little deeper. And the Holy Spirit gets to where you can't hear his voice. He can't convict you because you have said no so many times. Come on, <laughs> pay attention to what I'm saying. That, that, that the way to develop an ear that hears the voice of God is to say yes. When he says repent, you repent. When he says walk away, you walk away. When he says turn, you turn. And that yes opens you up. Man, I can hear God like never before. Why? Because you have been saying yes. And you've, you've developed a sensitive ear. Amen. And the, and the call of God to these seven churches is repent, repent, repent. He's not talking to that world. He's talking to his church. Repent. And the church is like, what do I need to repent of? I'm good. I'm rich and increased with goods and don't need anything. Well, yeah. There you go. He'll vomit you out of his mouth. Pastor, that's harsh. No, that's Bible. Read it. It's his response to the Laodicean church. And some of you here today, you can sense God knocking on the door of your heart. And he's saying, open that door. Amen. <laughs> open the door and invite him in. If your relationship with Christ is up to date and you sense an open door in front of you, amen, then you need to, you need to come and just say, Lord, I'm, gonna, I'm going through these doors. That's, that, that's the, the Philadelphia church, that open door church. That's the doorway to the east. It's the mission. Amen. Everybody ought to be tithing and then giving to missions. I was walking around this building yesterday praying. I, Jerry, I, I, I was doing it for you. I walked around here and prayed three times yesterday. And I was just and I, and, and I was looking at the back of this building right here. And man, the tin is all rusted out. And I'm like, Jesus. 
we need to replace that tin. That's going to cost a little bit, but we're going to replace it. And then I'm like, well, no, why don't we just build, just extend the room out there further? That would really what we need to do. And then I'm like, well, then we can do this. And I'm like, Lord, we just need a, we need a brand new building over here on this four acres. <laughs> and I'm like, how in the world are we going to do that? So I begin to walk around this church. Lord, you, we, we need funds. I need a miracle. Amen. Just, just, drop, just drop that money on here and we'll just build you a building. Amen. Amen. And I'm like, no, Lord, we're all going to have to be tithers. If we, see, this is how the ADD brain works. We're all going to have to be tithers. If that, and then we're going to have to get, so everybody ought to give at least start 10% to mission, 10% uh, tithe, 1% to missions. That'd be a good place to start. So that's just, that's just what, what I was, I was, me and Lord were talking about yesterday. I just want to let you in on that conversation. Because they want us to come back to Zambia. We're going to Ethiopia in June, and, and, and we've got, we're planting churches all over Africa. It's so awesome. But it takes money to do that. It takes people to do that. It takes, it takes, amen. So I'm like, Lord, help us not to get the work in front of the mission. That we're going to love you in this building. It's nice. We, we, we take care of what he gave us. And if you want us to have another one, you'll, you, that'll, that'll come. But right now, we're going to focus on building this building. We're going to focus on building people. Amen. Come on. Come on. We're going to focus on, on, on making the main thing the main thing. And today, his focus in this service with you that are sitting in these chairs and those of you that are watching online, what's your trajectory? What is your spiritual trajectory this morning? If you're going off in another direction, right now, the Holy Spirit is saying, hit the stop button right there. Turn around. That's repent. Turn around. And let him be the lover of your soul. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I truly believe that Central is, as you told me 18 years ago, this is a candlestick church. It sure didn't look like it at that day. It sure looks a little more like it today, but Lord, I know that it's not what, it's not where we're at, it's our trajectory. I thank you for the trajectory of this church. And Holy Spirit, I just pray right now, in the mighty name of Jesus, that the men and women you've assembled in this room today, you're dealing with hearts and lives and you're drawing them. Lord, the last few services, we've seen people born again born again by the Spirit. And I pray this morning, if there's someone in here that is not saved, they're not, not headed to heaven, I pray today, right now, that Holy Spirit, you speak to them. You're, you're inviting them. You're knocking at the door of their hearts, saying, open the door and let me come in. Jesus. Speak. Father, I thank you for church members and people that are they consider themselves Christians but they realize through the reading of the word today that there are areas that they need to correct that their trajectory has been off one way or another right now right now Holy Spirit speak show them what they need to correct and Father there are those that are just they've been caught up in the culture the sexual sins of this culture that are rampant in the world has found its way into the church and we thought because you're a God of love you would wink at that but Lord you've, you, you've, you've spoken to them today and you've said I'm, I'm calling you out on this you need, to, you need to turn away from that and repent speak to them today Holy Spirit Lord you never tell us to repent but that you don't provide the power and the ability to do it Jesus, you never would have told that woman caught in adultery, don't sin anymore if you didn't intend to give her the power to say no to that sin. I thank you, Father, that you're waiting on us to act. And Lord, I thank you for those today that have an open door set before them. And you're encouraging them to walk through that door, whether it's ministry or a new job or, or taking a spouse or what, there's an open door. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, for talking to us. And we say collectively, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. If any of those things that I've just prayed out, if that's you, just stand. 
whether it's an open door or repentance or whatever, just come on. This is your opportunity. Just stand. Just stand. That's, that's an act, right? That's a spiritual act. Lord, I'm responding to what you're saying. I'm going to respond in the name of Jesus. Come on. Mm -hmm. See, if, if we sit when he's speaking, then his voice is going to become very distant. So I, I just ask you to be sensitive to his voice. If he's talking to you today, you need to stand. You need to stand. Say, Lord, that's me. I'm, I'm hearing you. I'm hearing what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Father, I thank you for hearts and lives today. Lord, you have, you're speaking to the church. Lord, I really believe all of us should be standing because there's something in these seven letters that speaks to every one of our hearts. I'm standing because there are things I need to turn from and I need to turn to you. So, Lord, help us. Help us. Some of you... It, it's these apps on your phone. It's and it and, and innocuous things. You know, I got rid of Facebook and all the Instagrams and all that stuff years ago, and and now it's it's other things have taken their place. You know, YouTube. I just I get all my news on YouTube, and it's like I spend so much time doing that. God, forgive me, forgive me for the addiction. Come on, is that anybody besides me? If that's you, and the Holy Ghost is talking to you, stand up. Now, it's one man said this. Look at me just a minute. I know some of you are standing for the open door, and, and we're going to pray over that too. But some, uh, I'm trying to remember who it was, C.S. Lewis or, or one of the old dead guys, said, you know, there was a, you know, he preached a sermon, called out, uh, you know, a man came forward just weeping and repented for his adultery. He asked God to forgive him, but he went back home and went right into it. Did he repent? No, because repentance is turning and doing, going in a different direction. So if, if, if you're repenting for something today, if it's just something as simple as a YouTube app, then you need to get on your phone and delete it. Come on, I did that one Sunday when I, I left here. I'm like, you know what? Because I'd seen the screen time that I'd spent on scrolling Facebook. I'm like, that's sin. Holy Ghost told me. I said, I said that's repentance. Deleting that app is repentance. Crying and asking God to forgive you is not repentance. It's the action. Come on. You got that? Amen. This is a good thing. It's the action. Amen. If, if God's setting before you an open door, a, a, an open door to ministry, and then, then walking through that door is the action. It's not just, oh, Lord, thank you for the open door. No, what are you going to do with that? Lord, I'm going to get out there and I'm going to preach. Well, you don't have a pulpit. Yeah, you do. Every street corner, every shopping cart in Walmart is a pulpit. Amen. Come on. Jesus. So why don't y'all, if you're standing, just come on up here. Come on. We're going to pray. Why don't you just, 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 just kneel. You, I don't, you don't need to talk to me. You need to talk to him. Find a place right here. Glory to God. Glory to God. Now, if you're coming as a family... Dads, I want, you to, I want you to get your family together, and I want you to grab them by the hand. Just pray with them. Amen. Men leading. Glory. I'd love to see that. Hallelujah. Open doors. Open doors. Just, just, just find a place. Find a place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jesus. We're just going to sing. to worship you. 
to 